Great. Thanks a lot for uh, joining today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate the invite. Seems like it's good timing too, because I, I saw your paper just came out. So that's very cool. It did. It's uh, hopefully still relevant a week out at this point. But yeah, it came out last week. It's been nice to get it off the desk, I must say. I'm sure. Um, well, <laughs> do, you have, do you have any questions about logistics or anything? Uh, I, I don't believe so. I mean, it, it should be pretty standard format. Yeah, for, 45 minute talk or so. And yeah, yeah. perfect. 40, 45. Okay, excellent. Great. Well, looking forward to it. Great. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat>
the computational resources we needed to produce this work. So thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to start by taking a, you know, sort of trivially, trivially broad perspective almost. Um, and, and that is simply that the earth is warming, right? It's doing so at an accelerating rate. This isn't news, thermometers alone tell us this. But to me, you know, it's not something we should be glossing over. 19 of the last 20 years are the hottest on record, soon to be, it seems, 20 out of the last 21 years. And it's a fact that raises some fairly basic but very fundamental questions, right? Questions as simple as how unusual is the magnitude and rate of modern warming from a broader geologic perspective? <clears throat> so to me, that's a pretty valid question, right? So we, we know there are some pretty big changes that have occurred just recently in Earth's climate. So in particular, over the last million years or so, this is the second half of the period known as the Pleistocene. Earth has oscillated at the beat of about 100,000 years between these cold glaciated states uh, into warm interglacials, including the one that we currently live in today. So I'm, I'm showing you these Pleistocene temperatures inferred from just one site on Earth. This is the Epicodome Sea site in East Antarctica. Uh, here, the glacial interglacial oscillations are on the order of about 10 degrees or so. And we can, of course, you know, I'm sure you've seen some iteration of this, juxtapose these changes against the ice core CO2 record. This correspondence is probably one of the most important climatic discoveries of the last hundred years because it shows that irrespective of leads or lags, the two are intimately linked. And that's, of course, a problem for the last 150 years. We've been performing something of an experiment, pumping massive amounts of potent gases into our atmospheres levels today, well past double those of glacial baseline levels. And so as we're wading into this new world, right, this plus 400 parts per million CO2 world in the 21st century, it is important that we understand how the climate system has responded on a very fundamental level to similarly massive changes um, for example, in CO2, but also other radiative forcings during the past. And so I want to present the last glacial maximum, this most recent glacial cycle, as a very interesting starting point and a possible viable analog for understanding future Earth system's responses to large-scale climate forcing. You know, it's for this very reason that the last glacial maximum has been a focal point of research for the last several decades. <clears throat> and so let's kind of back up here, right? So what is the last glacial maximum? So the literature places this at around 22 to 18,000 years ago. So from a geologic perspective, really wasn't so long ago, but it was effectively a different world than the one we live in today. So sea levels were 130 meters lower than present. Because of this, continental coastline configurations were quite a bit different. As you can see from this artist rendition, um, there would have been miles thick expanses of ice covering much of the Northern hemisphere. Parts of the Midwest and the middle latitudes would have resembled something like a rugged tundra. You would have had megafauna like these guys roaming around. So for all intents and purposes, this was a completely different world, but not so long ago. Right, so in contextualizing where we're at in understanding the evolution of climate since this period, for me, there are, are, are really two recent and important studies that warrant particular consideration. So the first was published by Jeremy Shackin and company in 2012 in Nature. A year later, Sean Marcotte published a paper in the journal Science. Together, these studies form the basis for producing what I'll refer to as the SMC, the Shackin market curve. This curve here, you know, composited together, shows an approximation of global temperature change during the last 22,000 years. These are based on proxies of temperature we get from various sources, sediments, pollen, ice, and each were averaged together, despite the fact that they're sparsely situated across space to give us a global average. So if you're unfamiliar with this literature, you know, I, I just want to stress that these, the simplicity of these curves really belies a sort of fundamental advance at that time of our understanding of the transient global temperature evolution since the last glacial maximum, but it opened up some also relatively large questions, or I should say discrepancies between what models or subsequent reconstructions tend to show uh, in relation. So there's questions surrounding the magnitude of deglacial warming, the timing of deglaciation, the spatial imprint of key millennial scale oscillations, uh, the direction of global temperature change across the evolution. This is known as the Holocene temperature conundrum. 
It reflects the discrepancy between what model physics predict and what proxies appear to show. And of course, we don't have the best insight from simple global mean temperature curves into things we might care about, such as climate coupling or dynamics. So in the coming slides, I'm going to try to touch on each of these various aspects in looking at the LGM to present evolution. And I'm going to raise three really big questions for today. First, just how have global temperatures evolved since the LGM? Second, what were the external mechanisms that were at play? And third, going you know full picture back to the first couple of slides, I showed how unusual is human caused temperature rise today? <clears throat> okay, so I, I mentioned that there's often this discrepancy that arises between what proxies suggest and what models show. And from my perspective, part of the problem here is that models and proxies, you know, they're, they're these complementary paradigms, but they've largely been viewed as also sort of contrasting paradigms. And what I mean by that is this, right? So each of these things can allow us independently to estimate the LGM to present climate evolution, but they do possess unique shortcomings. So let's look at right here. Proxies are numerous, but they're sparsely situated. And if we're being honest, you know, they often entail these broad uncertainties due to unknown or random processes, but they are our best sort of version or means of understanding the true climate evolution at a given point in space. We can contrast that with models which provide full field, you know, globally intact and dynamically intact realizations of past climate processes, but they still lack any of the real world constraints that proxies might otherwise provide. And so what I'm going to be pulling from today is this class of techniques that I assume most of you are probably familiar with to some extent known as data simulation. Our goal here is to really leverage the relative merits of both proxies and climate models together by explicitly combining them to produce both spatially complete but also proxy constrained insights into the past climate evolution. <clears throat> So, you know, to do this, I, I want to make the point here that it does require one to, I think, step back in a big way to build up the necessary infrastructure. Um, so what we've developed is new model simulations. We've developed new proxy compilations, as well as new statistical methods to understand the LGM to present climate evolution. So first, going through each, we have these new set of equilibrium, you know, time slice global climate simulations that entail our best understanding of the boundary conditions prescribed at various intervals of the last 21,000 years. Each of these models are ran for about a thousand years, sometimes more, and we're using the isotope enabled community earth system models, so versions 1.2 and 3. And this just allows us to explicitly resolve the water isotope cycling between the various coupled land, ocean, and atmospheric components. And this will be important later on in the talk when I try to prove to you that the product does validate pretty well. Um, I want to give a quick shout out here to Zhang Zhu, again, uh, who's right there at NCAR with you folks. Uh, Zhang was really instrumental in getting these model runs correctly set up and ran. And just to give you some overarching sense of, of what we're trying to do here, I'm, I'm showing you just one run where we set the boundary condition as those at the LGM. And the idea here is we're just allowing internal variability really to dominate. So we're doing this in order to build a viable distribution of estimates of the LGM state so that we can sample from this distribution in order to narrow down our data assimilation based reconstruction. And in fact, it's not just at 21,000 years, our LGM uh, present time scales, we're doing this, we're doing this at different intervals in the past. So 0, 3, 6, 9, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 21,000 years before present. And as we move backwards in time through our reconstruction, we're actually able to go through and pull from these various distributions as a prior to our reconstruction. And I'll return to this shortly. Okay, let's add in the second component of our sort of data assimilation ingredient list here. We, we have a large compilation of LGM to present marine geochemical proxies. So in this case, sea surface temperature proxies. This compilation currently comprises some 600 records which in turn are comprised of four well-established proxies of ocean surface temperature. We have the ratio of elemental magnesium versus calcium measured in planktonic foraminifera tests found buried in marine ocean sediments. <clears throat> We're also looking at the relative abundance of the heavy oxygen isotope O18 relative to O16. And we're using two 
relative newcomers in the proxy game here. These are biomarker temperature proxies. We're looking at UK37. This is the relative proportion of saturated versus unsaturated C37 long chain alkanones, as well as the tetra ether index of 86 carbons. This is known as TEX86. These are essentially long lived phytoplankton fats that we can measure in ocean sediments as well. Okay, so I, I'm not going to spend much time getting bogged down in, in how these proxy systems work. Other people you know, have, have, have thankfully studied these things really closely, and there's a strong physical basis for their use um, and how they provide a signal of temperature. The main thing I want to stress here is that we're now at the point, you know, two decades into the 21st century, where we have a lot of these measurements, okay? This figure at left here shows our own proxy compilation. And you can see that these records, you know, although they're largely limited to the coast where we have sedimentation rates that are high enough to give us centennial scale insights, the spatial and temporal coverage of our records is really strong. We have some 70,000 unique data points that we're using to assimilate our models. <clears throat> All right, finally, ingredient three out of three here, we have new statistics in order to understand climate from proxies. Okay, so this is really linking the proxies and models together. So the conventional approach here for understanding past climate is to take some proxy measurement, all right, apply a statistical or physical model shown by this curve. So, you know, F of proxy here and use it to understand climate. And so usually this is a deterministic relationship, right? Every unique proxy should give us a unique temperature value. But there's a few problems with this approach. And I just wanna point out two, right? There's a little room for error here. Proxies are usually noisy, and if we have noise dictating the proxy signal, this can give us really wonky temperature signals. But more sort of from a philosophical perspective, I, I want to point out the functional assignment here is actually wrong. We're using proxies to predict temperature in this model, but in nature, the functional relationship is exactly opposite of this, right? In nature, temperature and other environmental variables predict the proxy value. So what we've done here is flip that old paradigm up on its head. So I flipped the axis here. I've kept the same curve. And now we're saying that we can use temperature to predict, predict the proxies. And this is just like what occurs in nature. And we're gonna do so uh, in probability space, okay? So I'm gonna follow a Bayesian paradigm here. And we're saying that a distribution of temperatures that reflects our degree of confidence in that temperature range should give us a degree or an uncertainty range of proxy values. And so this model tends to be really stable and I would say, based on the functional assignment, it's rather honest. So we have a class of Bayesian models here. These are proxy forward models that allow us to forward model using climatic variables, estimates of the proxy values themselves for Delta 18O, UK 37, Mad Cow, as well as Tex 86. Um, I wanna make the point that Jess Tierney was really the one that was key in implementing and developing these statistical models and also affectionately coined these models as the Baywatch suite. Um, these are really powerful methods that allow us to do this, uh, this data simulation approach in a rigorous way, as I'll show. And if you're asking, you know, why we'd want to model the proxies themselves, you're actually on the right path. And I hope this clears it up because we actually have the ingredients at this point to run the assimilation. One of the things I, I think is really beautiful about data assimilation is that, you know, while the architecture is, is somewhat involved, um, the concepts underlying data set assimilation really are not. Um, and so if you're not really familiar with how this works, I'll, I'll just lay this out in sort of a broad format here. So the main assimilation equation, right, the update equation is simply this. It says that the assimilated posterior climate field, this is a reconstruction essentially, is simply the summation of an ensemble of viable prior modeled fields plus the difference between our proxy observations across space, the estimates of those proxies we get from forward modeling the proxy values using our prior estimates, and then taking the difference of those two proxy estimates and weighting it by this weighting matrix known as the Kalman gain, which transforms it back into climate space, okay? K really is quite simple as well. It's just the covariance of the model prior against the estimated proxies normalized by the covariance between our estimated proxies and 
the proxy uncertainty, which is prescribed by R here. So this equation is, is really intuitive, right? In effect, if the covariance between the prior and the proxy estimates goes up, K increases and we provide a greater update to the prior, if K becomes increasingly large, or excuse me, increasingly small, we resort back to the prior in our posterior state. And this can occur by assigning greater uncertainty to our proxy estimates or our prior observations. Okay. So we're using what's known as an offline ensemble common filter approach here, meaning we're not running this online or in real time as an update to the climate models, okay? Instead, what we're using is the output of our climate model runs to build up our prior. This is mainly for tractability in this case. So from the convenience of, of my own desktop computer here, I can actually run not one, but several hundred assimilations over the span of a day or so. And this allows us to just sample the uncertainty space of things like proxy age uncertainty, the proxy values we actually use, or the prior values we include in our assimilation. Uh, looks like I have a comment. I think I'm gonna return to that. <clears throat> okay, so what we've been able to produce from this framework is what I believe to be the first ever uh, globally resolved, it's dynamically consistent insofar as it's consistent with the models and the observationally constrained or proxy constrained reconstruction of global temperature since the LGM. This is what we call the last glacial maximum reanalysis or the LGMR. It's a 200 year reconstruction. This conforms to the resolution of our sediment data and it extends back 24,000 years. <clears throat> okay, so what are we seeing here? So. If we look at the last glacial interval from 24 to 18,000 years before present, we see that this planet is ubiquitously cold. The Earth is in this glaciated state. The cold thermal imprints of the ice sheets dominate the Northern Hemisphere. By around 18 to 17,000 years before present, we entered this deglacial interval. The Earth starts to quickly warm. The ice sheet thermal imprints recede as the ice sheets actually disintegrate. And coastlines began, of course, to approach their near present day configurations. And finally, as we converge towards seven to 8,000 years before present, we have reached a relatively stable interval. This is the Holocene, it's the current warm interval. It's what allowed human civilizations and society to develop amongst relative stability. And finally, of course, I have composited at the end here from 1850 to 2020 CE observations we get from traditional observations, things like temperature, we can see we've now reached the point where we're ubiquitously warm, at least relative to the pre-industrial state. So there have been some relatively large changes that have occurred across the entirety of the globe since the last glacial maximum. <clears throat> okay, so we can actually use these maps directly to calculate global mean temperature on a global scale, right? So I'm showing you here at left just the deviations in global mean temperature relative to the pre-industrial about 1850 CE. The shaded bands in this case just represent the confidence range that I've associated with several hundred assimilations conducted. Again, after just randomly varying the underlying model and proxy data, it gives some degree of insight into, into the confidence we have from our particular set of proxies or models. I also want to make the point here that I've stretched the last 1,000 years here um, from 1,000 uh, years before present until today, just so you can start to pick out recent features. And actually, this is the last millennium reanalysis produced by our colleagues at the University of Washington. And I've composited as well observations for the last 150 years. Okay, so from this temporal perspective, we pick out the same features we saw in the movie, right? At around 18,000 years before present, we're in this ubiquitously cold glacial state, on average about six to seven degrees cooler than the pre-industrial. From 17,000 years before present until about 9,000 years before present, we're in this deglacial interval. It's punctuated by these millennial scale deviations. Until at around 9,000 to 7,000 years before present, we've entered this current Holocene interval. And so this is really powerful. And, and, and while you know this global climate view is, is useful, I, I'd also want to argue But what's really useful about this technique is that with a global reconstruction, we can actually start to pick apart local scale features and interactions within the climate system as well. And so we'll take a, a local example. <clears throat> I can look 
at the exact evolution of temperature since the last ice age, right in Boulder, Colorado, where each of you are sitting, right? So we can see that the ground that each of you are sitting on right now would have been on the order of about 15 degrees Celsius cooler at around 18,000 years before present. Um, and there's other features that pop out. We can see this cooling dip at around 12,000 years before present. This is the interval known as the Younger Dryas. It's prece preceded by the relatively warm bowling Amarad. Uh, you know, this has been something that's been of interest to not just the scientific community, but the popular media as well. Of course, you've all probably seen the day after tomorrow. It's motivated, in fact, by this cooling that we see in the Younger Dryas. Um, you know, from our reconstruction, when differencing this period, the Younger Dryas relative to the Bowling Hourod, we can see that Younger Dryas cooling was actually indeed in line with what the day after tomorrow maybe loosely suggests that cooling in this region was really confined to the North Atlantic vicinity uh, in North America and Europe more broadly. So maybe they weren't so far off. We can also take a stab here at resolving the Holocene temperature conundrum. So for this analysis, one of the things we've been able to do is generate a proxy only reconstruction using our nearly 600 records. So I'm showing you this proxy only reconstruction alongside our data assimilation based reconstruction in red. Okay, so the confidence intervals are just the plus or minus one sigma range as well as the 95% confidence range shown as the dark and light red band respectively. And to produce this particular curve, we've essentially followed what SMC did. We first convert each proxy value into an SST. We then zonally average those SSTs. We then spatially average those zonal means. And finally, we scale the global mean SST to a global mean surface air temperature. So, you know, this isn't perfect, but it's, you know, I want to make the point, it's not really trivial how one goes about taking a sparse marine dominated proxy network and converting that into a global surface air temperature. But what I think is really remarkable here is that if we compare our proxy only curve to what SMC produced, and so I'm now showing you the scaled SMC curve as this dotted line, hopefully you can see that, <clears throat> we see that they're really similar. Um, and this is, this is interesting, right? So both show this relatively gradual deglacial onset. We see the same magnitude, well, granted the fact that this is scaled, a similar feature in the millennial scale events. And we see most importantly, this long-term Holocene cooling trend. We also see this in other reconstructions as well. So most recently, Daryl Kaufman and company have produced the 10, 12K reconstruction of the Holocene using a terrestrial network. Um, also shows this long-term Holocene cooling trend. But what's really interesting here that you can see in this below plot is that using the same proxy network, we're actually getting something completely different than when we use our proxies in a proxy-only framework. We actually show warming occurring over the Holocene. And this is in line with what other intermediate complexity transient simulations such as Trace 21K show. So this is, this is fascinating, right? And it, it begs the question of what's going on. And we think we've narrowed it down to two things. <clears throat> so first, one thing we're able to do in the LGMR is explicitly account for proxy seasonal biasing that have been thought to give rise to these trends, at least in part. So all proxies have seasonal bias, right? In the ocean, this is really due primarily to the temperature growth ranges that are exhibited by different planktonic species. So beyond specific ranges, plankton simply don't grow. So we can actually explicitly account for these biases by forward modeling proxies on a monthly basis in the LGMR. So we can take an example, right? So suppose a site cooled during the LGM such that we only have a couple months of growth during this time. And we can juxtapose this against the same site during perhaps the pre-industrial where we've warmed the climate system and now growth of phytoplankton represent many or, or perhaps most months out of the year. Our approach can account for these biases. And that's because data simulation actually leverages the covariance structure of the modeled fields between the monthly and annual fields to provide an update to the latter, the annual fields, right? And this is, you know, despite the fact that we're actually using specific months in our proxy forward models, this means we can explicitly account for these changes in proxy seasonal biasing, and we think remove this possible seasonal proxy bias. 
Second thing here is, is, is much more intuitive, but I also think more important, actually. As it turns out, LGMR is, is truly a global average. We're not relying on zonal averaging of sparse marine proxies. We truly encapsulate all components of the land and marine system, including, most importantly here, the evolution of the terrestrial ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, the existence of these ice sheets actually precluded insights of proxies from these locations, but they're critically important to account for. Accounting for the ice sheet evolution, especially in the early Holocene, where we have residual or waning components of these ice sheet systems, appears alone to largely account for what gave rise to the Holocene temperature conundrum. In the LGMR, we account for these ice sheet components. <clears throat> Okay, so I've given you some results at this point. Uh, maybe we'll step back if you're wondering, you know, whether and how much you should believe these results. I, I want to point out that we have a few different validation tests that we ran that I do think nicely underscore the veracity of our product here. So in the first approach, this is sort of the standard approach. What I've done is randomly withheld across the various iterations. So if we flip back and forth here, I'm withholding about 25% of our proxy network. Using those remaining 75% of the proxies, I'm producing a posterior climate estimate. And I can then combine this posterior climate state with our forward models, our Hasselhoff transforms, if you will, um, to forward model proxy values at the locations of the withheld proxies. We can then compare the actual observed withheld proxies against what's predicted using the posterior climate state and see how well we're doing. And as you hopefully can see here across all of the proxy values and across space, we're doing a pretty good job of reconstructing our, or at, at least encapsulating the observed proxy values in our reconstructed proxy state. And this tells us that we have at least minimal systematic biasing occurring in our assimilated state and relatively high covariance therein. <clears throat> so this is what's known as our internal validation approach. And I wanna contrast this against a more novel approach known as external validation. In this case, what we've done is we've compared our prior and our posterior fields to completely independent terrestrial proxies. In this case, the Delta 18O we can measure uh, directly from ice cores as well as speleothems. So, you know, this is a, a really stringent test and, and, and I think it's really worth highlighting. So as part of our reconstruction, what we're able to do is assimilate not just things like temperature, but also auxiliary fields such as the delta 18 of precipitation across space. And we do this just using the covariance of this field in the model with the forward model proxy estimates. And so at right, what I'm showing you here is just one arbitrary example of external validation where I've differenced our assimilated delta 18 of precipitation fields at 16,000 years before present relative to the pre-industrial. And so we have a difference climate field here in delta 18 space. And I've overlain this with differenced anomalies of delta 18 that we get from actual speleothem records shown as circles and ice core records shown as triangles. And I hope what's clear from this illustration is that in comparison to the observations, right, from our ice core and speleothem records, our assimilated posterior product is actually doing quite well. And in fact, if we compare the observed delta 18 difference anomalies for not just 16 versus 0Ka, but for all different time slices that we're able to compare in our posterior and prior products, we can see that in our posterior LGMR field, we're able to explain about 60% of the variance in the independent ice core and speleothem observations in our assimilated product. And this is a substantial improvement over the prior, which can really only explain about 30% of the variance. So another way of saying that is we're doing twice as well in this case uh, in the LGMR versus what the models alone can tell us. <clears throat> and you know, just to sort of beat a dead horse here, um, we can even go as far as directly comparing our assimilated LGMR Delta 18 NOAA precipitation anomalies to the full ice core and speleothem records themselves. So in this case, I'm showing you 
a few different legacy proxy data sets. At top, we have the Donga and Hulu Cave Spilithum records from East Asia, as well as the North Grip record from Greenland. This is an ice core record. Uh, and two records from Antarctica, the Waste record from West Antarctica and the EDML record from East Antarctica. <clears throat> Again, I hope what's clear here is when comparing the observations shown as the dotted dashed dark red lines to what we recover in the LGMR, we're doing a pretty good job of reproducing these records from the ground up. And I, personally, I, I actually find this slide to be, for me, one of the most amazing aspects. Um, it posits to me that the LGMR is indeed doing a very good job of improving our understanding of the coupled LGM to climate evolution beyond what either proxies or models alone can tell us. <clears throat> okay, so starting to wind down a little bit in this talk here, um, I'm going to get towards our second question here of what seems to be driving these large scale LGM to present changes. So with the spatial temporal reconstruction, we can dissect the global drivers across these centennial to millennial scale time scales. And in this case, using an EOF analysis, so an empirical orthogonal function analysis to decompose our spatial temporal fields into unique linearly orthogonal modes of variability. And when we do so, what we find is two structures or two modes of interest. So in the first mode, we observe a heterogeneous positive loading across the globe. The largest loading here occurs across the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets. And moving to the second mode, we see this interesting dipole structure. It's somewhat reminiscent of what you might expect from perhaps the classic bipolar seesaw response. And the associated temporal modes are shown here at right, PC1 and PC2 are in red and blue respectively. Again, the shaded bands as in prior slides are just the plus or minus one sigma as well as 95% confidence ranges from our reconstruction ensemble. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna first concentrate here on, on inferring what's happening with PC1. So this is a mode that's clearly associated with global scale warming and deglaciation. And indeed, you know, by comparing our PC1 curve to greenhouse gas radiative forcing estimated directly from ice cores, as well as estimates of albedo, uh, which in this case are simply just scaled estimates of the modern planetary albedo relative to <clears throat> paleo ice sheet extent, we find that the combination of not one individually, but both forcings together really best explain this mode. And it suggests that both of these radiative aspects are needed to fully understand the mechanisms of global scale deglaciation. <clears throat> All right, so moving now to PC2, we've, we, we, we kind of see a more curious form here, and it seems to consist of these long-term sinusoidal trends as well as millennial scale oscillations or deviations from that trend. <clears throat> so we've separated the second mode of variability into two components of what I'll term as the residual component, as well as the trend component in yellow and purple, respectively. So we're finding that the yellow residual curve seems to be very positively and tightly correlated with the established proxy we have for North Atlantic Ocean overturning strength. This is the protactinium thorium ratio found in Bermuda rise sediments. Uh, and, and, you know, via our EOF loading here, it suggests that a weakening of the ocean overturning cell would tend to cool the northern hemisphere high latitudes while warming the low latitudes in the southern hemisphere, sort of in line with what we have might expect from prior studies. Um, but going a little further than this, if we look at the trend component here, this is where it gets interesting to me, right? This in turn seems to be associated with the seasonal insulation response that we see at higher latitudes, and in particular, what PC2 trend seems to be showing is a tight leakage to summer duration in the Southern hemisphere. Um, the EOF loading again, in this case, could imply a nonlinear association across the annual, right? So this is probably something related to Southern hemisphere sea ice. As we increase summer length, um, we actually increase mean annual temperatures across much of the Southern ocean. Now, Combined, 
Both modes are explaining over 95% of the global LGM to temperature evolution, but these modes aren't even close to equal in their importance in this case. Overall PC1, right? So the radiative influence of global albedo and greenhouse gases explains an overwhelming majority, about 90% of the variance. And this is an important consideration because harking back to my introduction here, the overwhelming importance prescribed to the first mode of variability is important to consider because the greenhouse gas forcing in particular that we've applied in the 100, last 150 years has really skyrocketed. Um, and it brings us full circle to the question I posed at the beginning of the talk, which is simply how unusual are modern changes from a geologic context? <clears throat> so let's try to answer that. Um, to do so, I'm gonna refer back to the global mean temperature curve I showed in previous slides. And from this, it's, it's very evident that warming today from this composite approach, at least, is highly unusual in the context of LGM to present changes. The most recent decade of warming now sits at about a degree and a half above the Holocene long average. Okay, so this is considerable, but there's also another aspect to consider here, and that is the rate of change relative to the past. And we can actually test this as well. So as a conservative test, I'm just gonna focus on the deglacial interval. Of course, this is where the largest uh, and fastest global mean temperature changes occurred. And focusing on this interval, we can look at the distribution of changes we see in the LGMR using a histogram or PDF approach. As expected, this histogram skews right, so in general, indicating warming values. And I can directly compare rates of modern warming by moving decade-wise from the start of compiled modern observations in 1850 to present and compare against the deglacial warming rates. And what is clearly evident when I do so is that by the time we've progressed into the 20th century, you know, we were already at the tail end of this distribution. Unequivocally, warming rates, warming rates today are, are far beyond the bounds of what appears from our reconstruction to be possible from natural changes alone. And I want to note as well that, you know, this is an important conclusion that appears robust to whether or not we scale the LGMR deglacial warming distributions to account for decadal scale variations in the ICSM, or you know, whether we test, uh, for example, the trace 21K warming rates that have been scaled up to reflect the higher magnitude of LGM to present warming we find in our reconstruction. So to summarize here, our LGM to present reconstruction is underscoring the dramatic nature of anthropogenic warming today, whose magnitude and rate appear very unusual in the context of the last 24,000 years. <clears throat> so that's a, a bit of a sobering ending, but maybe this will be a bit more uplifting. I, and, and that's that I think taking the broad view here, this is a really exciting avenue of research for understanding climate change in the past and potentially for helping to constrain the future. There's a lot of room for upward mobility in terms of understanding past climate moving beyond just temperature as well. So we're currently using the LGMR looking at changes in past atmospheric dynamics and jet stream changes, as well as Hadley cell and Walker cell circulation changes. And these should publish, I hope, in the next half year or so. Um, I should make the point right now, you know, if you have any fields of interest for your own analyses, we can likely assimilate it using the ICSM. So please reach out. I also want to make the broader point that you know, if, if we can model a given time period of the past, and if we have proxies available to help constrain those models, data simulation really gives us the possibility of reconstructing that period in full, dynamics and observations intact. And, and I think, you know, the Earth's climate history is, is rich and variable and old. Um, and as we're starting to push towards this increasingly greenhouse world, it is important that we start to look further into the past. Um, I strongly believe paleoclimate data simulation is one of the best means of getting us there. Uh, and you know, please be on the lookout for upcoming work looking on these deeper timescales by the Tierney Group. <clears throat> and finally, I, I wanna make the final overarching point that data simulation, it really is only as good as the model and proxy data that underpins it. We've really only scratched the surface here. 
And as a community, I think we need to keep pushing for more and better proxies, models, and statistics, right? Proxy systems models. Integrating these new constraints will indeed require careful community coordination. It will require widespread expertise, possibly from you. Um, and I hope you won't hesitate to reach out if I piqued your interest. Uh, I wanna thank your time. I'm happy to take questions. My contact information, as well as uh, information on where you can find this particular study is on the screen here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matt, for that exciting talk. Um, <clears throat> we now have uh, plenty of time for some questions. So I would encourage folks to um, raise their hands or go ahead and type any questions in the chat, uh, maybe confining any commentary on the validity of the uh, day after tomorrow to the pages of the popular press. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, Clara, uh, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks so much for just a superb talk. Oh, thank you, Clara. Really, really wonderful. <laughs> thank uh, you. I didn't see how to raise my hand, so that's why <laughs> I put it in the chat. Uh, I just have sort of loose questions. One was um, two, th uh, two, two different observations. One is that you really, of course, lack the marine sediment proxy records in much of the tropical Pacific yeah. uh, Ocean. And of course, that occupies a lot of area that goes into the estimate of the global mean temperature. Yeah. Wondered if you had any comments on that. Um, and then the second thing was your, your time series of for the over the Holocene um, of the global mean temperature from the LGMR versus the proxies, it looked to me like the younger Dryas, if I understood the wiggles right, that it was actually, I think, leading, in the LGMR was leading the proxies. Uh, and I wondered if that was just something my eye saw or if that, uh, it seemed uh, maybe an important, yeah, the blue, exactly, the dip in the blue, it, yep, seems hmm. to precede the dip in the red. And I wondered if that has to do with that you're, you know, you're going from climate to proxy, not proxy to climate, which I like. Uh, and <laughs> that's very striking to me. And I wonder if that can help to really understand hmm. uh, causality. So those are just two, two things. Yeah, I'll, I'll just make a few brief comments because um, those are both really pertinent observations. Um, so in regards to the proxy network, uh, yes, we're, we're well aware that the, uh, un unfortunately, coverage in the Pacific Ocean at large, and especially the tropical Pacific is, uh, it leaves much to be desired, let's say that. Um, it's just, it's, it's an undersampled region. Um, these are also regions that have relatively low sedimentation rates. So in terms of understanding at least the LGM to present evolution, we're just not getting the resolution from much of the sites that we do have in these regions. Um, you know, I would I would hope that work like this really pushes the uh, proxy experts around the world to find sites in the the Pacific at large uh, to fill in these gaps because it's really important. You know, the Pacific Ocean constitutes much of the land area and it's something that we're really missing in terms of constraints. So I, I, I don't have much to say other than I, I strongly agree with you on that, on that matter. Um, in terms of your question regarding, uh, which direction was it? One second here. Oh, there we are. In terms of the, the sort of small mismatch uh, in terms of the timing of the younger Dryas. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually have to admit this is the first time anyone's brought that up, Clara. And uh, you're right. It looks like the proxy only estimate is occurring maybe a few centuries after what the data simulation is showing. Uh, I'll look into it. I, I don't have a perfect answer for you. One thing I will say is that the largest signal that we're getting of the youngest, younger Dryas in our data simulation approach is terrestrial in this case. So it reflects the waxing and waning on these millennial timescales of the Laurentide in particular. Uh, obviously, we're not picking that up directly in the proxy only approach. So if I were to intuit what was going on here, I would put my money, I suppose, on the fact that it's really terrestrial changes that are driving those discrepancies. Interesting. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Claire. I think I should had a follow-up um, wondering if it might be a different definition of the present day of 1850 versus 1950. Uh, so it's, it's typed here. Uh, so, so excuse me, I guess I'm missing, like, could you reiterate or elaborate on what the question is? I, I believe the context was Clara's question about the phase of this oh. reconstruction, and I should maybe suggesting that some of that could be accounted for by differences in definition of what present day is. Oh, uh, well, we've, we've accounted for that in, in this visual. It's, it's 1950 for both. Great. Thank so they you. should be correctly aligned. <laughs> um, Dylan has a hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Awesome presentation. Um, thanks, Dylan. I, I'm just, I'm struck by, you know, the advances that have been made in, in the most, you know, the last few years on um, combining models and proxies. And I'm wondering if we're starting to get the capability to move beyond simulating past mean state changes and starting to think more about variability. Um, is there, I know that these are um, 200 year time slices that you're showing here, but I'm wondering if we could start thinking about something like Nino 3.4 variants in these 200 year time slices to start getting a sense of how climate variability has varied over the past you know, 20,000 years? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, uh, the, the short answer for you, Dylan, is, is yes, absolutely. And I, I hope something that comes out of this talk is that that should be the direction we start pushing these data simulation approaches, right? So um, I, I hate to say low hanging fruit, but I, I guess I will say it. Temperature is a low hanging fruit and that's what we first targeted, but with these temporal, um, insights, we can actually start to pick apart specific aspects of the climate system, such as Nino 3.4. We have sea surface temperature in this case. So if you're interested in it, I could, I could send you that data. We can look at it. Um, in terms of narrowing down the time scales, I think we want to be honest here. So it depends what type of proxy data we're assimilating. So if we were to focus on speleothem or ice core data, we could narrow down the range of variability to maybe decadal scale variants. Um, Sediment data is is really limited in terms. Whoa! I think the fire alarms are going off here. Um, I'll, I'll finish this question. <laughs> um, uh, we are limited with sediment data uh, in terms of the the resolution in this case. Two hundred years is about as best as we can do, and I think it'd be a little dishonest to try to go higher resolution. Different types of proxies will help to narrow us uh, narrow the time scales down, and we should focus on that in the future. Sure. Yeah, and I, pr I appreciate that. I'm, I'm wondering, maybe you'd mentioned it earlier as well, but are you assimilating in coral records as well, which might have higher resolution in time? Uh, in this case, we're not. I believe, and, and perhaps Dan can correct me, the LMR, which is looking at the last one to 2,000 years, does uh, assimilate coral records. Am I right? Sorry, I'm typing the text to tell you not to stick around if there's actually a fire alarm. Uh, you um, know what? It stopped, so I'm not... <laughs> I, okay. I think I think it's okay. Usually it keeps going, so I think I think we're fine. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, the LMR um, assimilates some coral records. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate it. Again, great presentation. Thank you. Um, all right. If uh, it's not on fire, there, um, Claire, I had a <laughs> follow-up question about the conundrum. Uh, only if there's no other questions. I don't want to take. Over. Okay. Uh, so on this slide that you have here, I just want to make sure I have your message clear in my head <laughs> that the proxy record that the red curve that was showing a, a slight cooling over the Holocene, yep. that is actually erroneous. And it's maybe partly because seasonal, seasonal changes in, seasonal, in the seasonal footprint, I guess, of these proxies changed over time, and maybe that was not properly accounted for. So you're saying, indeed, if we do trust this data simulation, it shows, if anything, slight warming over the Holocene. Is that the correct message? That's exactly correct, Clara, yeah. Okay, and is there another way to test or, or to use the proxies themselves to go back to just the proxies, forget the model, and, and really, is there a way to test this hypothesis about that, you, that the, the way the proxies are treated, that they were missing this important 
effect of changes in seasonality. It just seems to me this is so important uh, to really uh, in resolve independently without a model. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, no, I mean, and, and that's one of the reasons it's it's been for at least the paleo climate community, really one of the most pressing problems I think of the last decade is that there's not a trivial way to go back and, and check that, right? So when you measure a proxy value, there is gonna be an underlying bias, but it's unclear what that bias may be and how that might've evolved over time. And so we think with this approach where we're explicitly modeling these changes on a monthly basis and encapsulating that temporal change over time, we're able to encapsulate those changes to the best of our ability insofar as the models also encapsulating those changes. Um, but it, it, in terms of validating whether we're doing that in the best possible way, it's tough. Um, I, I talked a little bit about the validation exercises that we did, and they seem to show that we're doing a pretty fine job for the most part. So that gives me some degree of confidence that we are in fact capturing the true global climate evolution over the Holocene, but it's, 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 it's challenging. Yes. Could you rerun your, uh, some of your, could you, could you do another set of data simulation runs where you explicitly disallow this seasonal effect to operate? So you, you, you mm -hmm. only allow for annual mean, uh, yep. Yep. And, and then if you, if you got cooling, then to me, that would be a very powerful test of your hypothesis. Yes, yeah. um, and, and so we've done this. Uh, oh. And it's it's written up rather extensively in oh. our supplementary of our paper um, <laughs> and also our extended data figure six. Um, and, and this gets towards my point that I think seasonality has some impact, especially on a couple of the proxies, magnesium, calcium, for example. I think what the, the clearest benefit of the LGMR is though, is that we're, we're removing spatial biasing. I think that's the biggest thing leading to the Holocene temperature conundrum. We're mitigating that by actually having a global average in this case. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, in general though, I would refer you to the paper, which can go into much greater detail than I, I could possibly do right now standing here. Sounds good, thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Um, Katie, go ahead. Hi, thanks for the really nice, really interesting talk. Uh, I guess you you started to answer a question I had at the end, like looking at other time periods. So yeah. could you say a little bit more about if you know the work that's going on with the PETM and how that approach to like a global warming period might compare to this approach where you're looking at a global cooling period? <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, in general, I will say that Jess Tierney right now, who's second author on this particular paper, is focusing uh, her efforts right now on a study on the PETM. So that work should be forthcoming, hopefully in the next year. Um, yes, the, the motivation for studying that period is, of course, it gives some analog to what might occur in the next uh, few decades or a century. Um, but I don't want to I don't want to drop too much on that. Um, it's also not my work, so I, I'm not at liberty to do so. But we, um, you know, one thing I will say is we're using the same proxies as we're using here. So it's, it is the same approach. Thanks. Yep. Great, and we have a uh, question in the chat um, from Jeff Anderson asking if you use any type of spatial localization in your offline ensemble filtering. Yes, uh, yes we did. Um, we used a localization with a radius of 24,000 kilometers. So this is really broad localization. So it says that, uh, you know, proxies in different hemispheres can inform other hemispheres. Uh, we tested this extensively. It seems like 24,000 years is sort of near optimal from what we can tell. Um, it does better than applying no localization um, and it does better than applying tighter localization such as like 12,000 years, which is what former studies have shown work best for other pro proxy networks. Um, again, I, I, I would refer you to the, the study which goes into this in, in pretty extensive detail. Thanks, and uh, Moha has a hand raised. Hi, thanks, man. This is this was very nice. Um, maybe you've mentioned it, I and I missed it. So sorry if, if that happened. Um, no I'm wondering how do you? I'm not familiar so much with the 
with proxy data, but how do you parameterize the observation error covariance for this reconstructed proxy data? Because it seems to me it's a crucial step in your data simulation exercise here. Yeah, um, so it, it, it's one of the challenging things. So with our forward modeling approach of these proxies, um, doing it in probability space provides a sort of convenient means of gaining uh, insight into the error covariance. And this is based on global calibrations, right? So <clears throat> given a distribution of viable temperature states for any point in time, we can infer a distribution of viable proxy values. And this informs our proxy covariance. Um, we're using the native covariance structure of the model against the proxy covariance to inform the, the proxy covariance across space. So both of these things come together to give us estimates of the uncertainty, essentially, of our assimilation. So does that mean that like you are in the, in the de denominator in your uh, uh, update equation? Yep. Uh, is it a full covariance or is it a, like just a diagonal matrix? Oh, I see. Uh, we're, it's, we're assuming it's diagonal. So we're saying that the proxies are essentially independent of each other. Um, there's reason to question this. It seems to work pretty well in our case, as opposed to assuming uh, covariance amongst the proxies. But yeah, conventionally, we assume a diagonal covariance structure. Thank you. And again, this comes directly from the proxy systems models. Excellent. Well, that takes us right to noon. Um, Matt, thanks again um, for your talk and thanks Thank everyone you. for the conversation and uh, look forward to seeing you this time next week. Take care.